Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. Hello, this is National HROs and HRO Clones for the Antique Wireless Museum's YouTube channel. We're going to, I'm going to give you an overview of National HRO evolution up through World War II. Um, we're going to talk about the characteristics of the various models of HROs. So if you're at a ham fest or a swap meet, you, sh you should be able to uh, tell the difference uh, without even touching them. Uh, we're looking for very early HROs. Uh, the first one's serial number D1, and it's missing in action, so we want to find it. And also, uh, it's, it's been said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so I'm going to give you an introduction to the many HRO lookalikes manufactured by other companies worldwide. So in the beginning, uh, National was started by three Stone and Webster engineers. Their day job was designing peripherals for power plants. But in 1914, they started making toys for F.W. Woolworth and uh, became the National Toy Company. Now, around 1923, they started making household appliances and radio components, variable capacitors and coils. Their name changed to the National Company. And later on, it was National Company Inc. Inc. and then National Inc. Now, before the HRO, there, they had a, a number of uh, small uh, shortwave receivers, starting with the SW2, then the SW4, SW45, SW5, uh, SW58C, and finally, the SW3, uh, which I think was their, their biggest uh, seller of these radios. Most of these early radios before the SW3, they're, they're brownish in color, um, and uh, you can see a few of them here. That's also a very rare metal coil, coil box up on the top left uh, on top of the SW4. Now, if you were a radio manufacturer back in the 1920s, one of the biggest customers was the, the U.S. government um, and uh, airports and the new airway stations. Uh, what was happening uh, was they were trying to fly mail across the country, and they did so at first during the daytime and then later on by night. And um, what they needed um, for night flying was some beacons on the ground every so often um, that would um, help the, uh, the early nighttime mail pilots uh, find their way. Here's a picture of a typical airway station circa 1940 from the air. You can see its names on top of the roof. Um, there's a big arrow pointing to the next station. Sometimes these are concrete. This, this one's made out of logs. And also there's a light beacon up on top. And depending on what colors the light beacon gave off, uh, the pilot would know if they could land in an emergency or not. So here's a typical uh, airway station, uh, very early, uh, in Medicine Bow, Wyoming. And if we glance over at the radios, we see uh, a couple of interesting national receivers that predate the HROs. And if you notice um, the, the ID tag that's underneath the main tuning dial, it's pretty long and rectangular. This tells me it was the RHM airport receiver. Uh, which was circa 1932. It had four controls all across the bottom of the receiver. Uh, it used three coils at a time, and then also you would need a rack for uh, all the other coils. And there would also be a power supply of some sort. They made about 100 of these, so they're pretty scarce. Um, again, if you happen to see a radio like this, um, to tell it... Uh, the difference between the, the earliest RHM model and the later AGS, which we'll talk about in a second. Look at the main tuning dial. If it has the word national all in upper cases, then it's, uh, it's one of the earliest uh, of these types of receivers. Also, the data tag underneath um, should be long and rectangular and uh, actually say type RHM. Now, my RHM is missing the data tag, but I can see from the holes that it, uh, it, you know, it's again this shape. And 
Hopefully I can get one manufactured. Here's the follow-up receiver um, called the AGS, or Airport Ground Superhead. In addition to the four controls across the bottom, there was also three new controls. One was BFO, variable BFO, one was some selectivity, and one was a way of turning off and on the radio um, uh, from the front panel. So when you change the coils, um, uh, you wouldn't get a big pop in your ear. Also, if you notice the main tuning dial, it no longer says national in uppercase, it says velvet vernier. And the ID tag of the AGSs uh, is, is more, more, much smaller rectangle. Um, it doesn't extend out past the, um, the diameter of the knob. Now, National also tried to sell these to hams circa 1933, but it was a pretty expensive situation. They also tried to make it a little more attractive. Uh, they sold a few in mahogany wooden cabinets. And um, um, they had a, a crystal um, filter option, and also they were offering some ham band coils at that time. Most hams instead bought the National FB7, which was a cost-reduced AGS. It used uh, two of the same coils instead of three. Uh, it was a seven-tube set and um, it came with one set of coils, no power supply or speaker. So you had to come up with all that for $55, for about a quarter of what an AGS would cost you. Now, um, in addition to airway stations, um, National tried very hard to sell their radios to airports. Here's a picture of the Fort Wayne, Indiana airport radio, a beautiful radio, and it's actually got two receivers in the rack. At the bottom, we can tell it's an AGS because the, uh, the data tag is more squat, squattier than the, than the long RHM. Also, um, one of the earlier SW58Cs, which was a medium wave uh, receiver. And then, and, then, and then the power supply uh, above that. And then two sets of coils, um, one for the SW58 and one for the AGS. And now at the top is a early national rack speaker, and the earliest ones did not have any type of uh, grill uh, protection on them. Now here's sort of a evolutionary radio as they move toward the HRO. One of the big complaints was the coils, that um, uh, too many coils, too hard to um, put them in the right order, that type of thing. So this, this follow-up receiver uh, that was also built for the uh, Department of Commerce, Aeronomics Branch, Airways Division, Lighthouse Service, um, to use on the airways, not to use in a lighthouse, um, has this plug-in module. And that's actually, it looks like two coils, uh, but it's actually three coils with two finger pulls. Um, so instead of dealing with three individual coils, um, you had uh, modules instead. So they were moving toward the HRO um, coil model. Now, the AGS replacement design team um, was actually handle, handled by two groups. Uh, on the East Coast, you had James Millen, who was the chief engineer and general manager of National. And he was a mechanical guy more than anything else. Then you had Herbert Hoover Jr. and his electrical design team out in Pasadena. And their goal was not to come up with a receiver that was made from an assembly of broadcast parts, but they wanted to completely designed from antenna to output. Here are some of the AGS replacement design goals. Uh, good sensitivity and low noise floor, and uh, they thought that could be obtained best by use, still using plug-in coils. Also keep heat and the noise out of the receiver, so that meant an external power supply. And um, as far as the coils go, um, and stability, they wanted to keep the heat away from the coils, so they actually double shielded the coils. And the, um, the AGS replacement receiver, they wanted to have two stages of RF instead of one, and they called this dual pre-selection, and that gave better performance above 20 megacycles. And um, first and foremost, they needed dial accuracy and repeatability. And that uh, was provided by a new PWD dial and the, uh, the, the uh, accompanying uh, PW gearbox. 
and this was new. And then they also wanted to offer spread, uh, band spread option coils for the amateur market. A few more design goals were a front panel adjustable BFO, a crystal filter, an S meter, and a front panel standby switch. So here's the uh, earliest pictures of the national uh, PWD uh, or HRO dial and the accompanying gearbox. So they called this the HRO micrometer dial, came out late 1934. Its effective scale length was 12 feet and it was direct reading, uh, one part in 500, but had good resolution. 10 complete turns from stop to stop. Uh, the gearbox was geared 20 to one. And of course it was a required piece of this. And uh, one of the, the, the greatest advantages of this dial and gear is the repeatability. So if you knew that 3885 was found at uh, 437 and you, you changed it to a different frequency and you needed to get back on 3885, if you turned it to 437, um, there it was. So they did not have direct readout receivers uh, at this point. They would have to use a frequency standard or a low powered transmitter crystal control to help do that. Now the first 100 HROs were serial number D1 through D100. And uh, uh, part of the goals of this presentation is to get everybody looking for the earliest HROs, the D models. And, uh, and just to let you know, D1, the first HRO off of the um, assembly line is still missing an, an action. In fact, the, the lowest, I think the, the earliest serial number HRO that I know of is like D15. So that means the first 14 are, are still out there somewhere. I'll tell you how to identify them shortly. There was a really interesting article in Electric Radio Magazine uh, a couple of years ago um, very famous people, very prominent people, um, uh, were in line to get the first 100 HROs. For example, uh, Herbert Hoover Jr., um, Howard Hughes. Um, the story goes that he wanted two or three of the HROs, and uh, he drove to the factory, and uh, he got there too late. So he slept in his car, so he'd be there first thing in the morning to get uh, some of the earliest HROs. And then you, if you look down this list, very famous people. Um, also, um, much of the staff of the ARRL at this point. Admiral Byrd is another one. So, very interesting. So here are some of the traits of the earliest HROs. And we're going to talk about all these. The first one is a plated German silver dial. And uh, this pointer um, is... Uh, the earliest of the pointers. So they, they tended to get lost for some reason and replaced with just smaller, less, uh, less nice pointers. Also, um, these are called pearl button HROs because there was a, a, um, a, a pearl looking button near the S meter and it was, um, it was, you had to push the button to make the, S, the uh, meter read correctly. Um, one of the downsides of that is um, um, you couldn't leave the S meter um, showing all the time. And the other thing is when you press the button, it would pop in your earphones because it was actually breaking the B plus. So um, the whole pearl button idea didn't last very long. The other thing you might look for on earliest HROs are what I call half height knobs. Uh, the knob on the left is from an early HRO the knob on the right is from a later HRO. So glance at the knobs um, when, you're, when you're looking at an HRO. Also, the earliest HROs had painted black chassis and the gearbox, the top of the gearbox is also black. And the IF cans there on the back row are round. Also, um, very small um, ventilation holes on the back, and there are no side louvers, which uh, National moved to later on, on the sides. Now, the main thing is to look at the antenna and ground terminals, 
And um, on the earliest um, HROs, the serial number is stamped uh, in the metal right in front of the, the ground and antenna connector, which is on the side. You can see this one on the left is D35. So that was the 35th HRO off the manufacturing line, which is pretty amazing if you think that uh, in total, national ships some 60,000 HROs of various models um, during its uh, tenure. Here's another uh, very early HRO. This is D34. Now it's been modified a bit over time. It still has the correct meter. You'll notice it does not have a pearl button uh, anymore. Somebody has replaced it with a toggle switch, which is very common. The, um, the PWD dial uh, is, has been changed to the second generation knob, which is sort of a gray-blue gunmetal type of color. And this was the second knob um, offered by National. It, this receiver does not have a pilot light on the front to the right of the main knob, and that is correct. The first, um, the D models did not have a pilot light, and that was one of the complaints. So later, the, uh, you could either retrofit your earliest HROs with the pilot light, the factory would do it for you, or you could add your own. The other thing is the coils. Uh, this coil has, um, has two scales on it, and uh, that means it's a band spread coil. And also, uh, the background of the, uh, the, the labels are white, and it has black print on it. And that's also correct for the earliest coils. Um, on this particular HRO, you can see a, uh, a pilot light was, was added, and I'm not sure if this one was factory or not. Also down on the bottom, um, somebody has changed the, the two graphs on this particular coil, and uh, instead of having a, a, um, a graph that you would interpolate, they've just gone ahead and wrote down exactly what the uh, number settings are for their favorite stations and frequencies. And also, if you glance down at the bottom right knob, um, you, can, you, can, you might be able to notice that it's one of the higher um, knobs, not the low uh, profile knobs. So that knob's been replaced sometime uh, over the years. And here we're looking inside of D35, and you can still see the round IF coils, the black chained back painted chassis, black gearbox, uh, et cetera. And that's the crystal over on the far left. That's a, a plug-in crystal. So those crystals uh, tended to, to get separated over time. Here's another picture of the coils that came with uh, the D35. Uh, um, and then the one in the top right, that chart is correct. And that's the way all of these should look. Um, but instead, the, the owner of this coil wanted a list of frequencies um, instead of uh, interpolating the graphs as you normally do. Now, if you ever see a, an HRO coil with only one graph, which would be over, over on the left, and a logging chart on the right, that means it does not have band spread which means the tuning is going to be a little sharper than what it would be if you happen to have a band spread coil. You can also glance at the coils uh, and to see if they are band spread or no band spread. If, if both of the little um, um, windows were empty on the front of the coil. So no band spread, and you can see there's only one contact um, or one jumper on three of the cans of the top coil and none on the other one. Whereas a band spread coil, if you look down at the bottom, you see a lot more of the jumpers. So that's, the, that's a difference. Now here's E55. Uh, I think they made a few hundred E models, which came after the D models. They're still um, pearl buttons and they still had the, the same um, plated German silver dial and that type of thing, low, low profile knobs. This particular one has the wrong meter. And it's pretty common that the meter would fail over time and be replaced by a later generation uh, meter. The original meter went from uh, it was S units one through five, and then it had a big empty uh, space over on the right for stronger signals. 
So here's the um, uh, a list of the production runs by serial number versus the build dates. So you can get a, if you know the serial number of your HRO, you can get a sense for when it was uh, manufactured. Now the HRO evolved uh, over time. For example, the, uh, starting with the F serial numbers, uh, the Pearl button changed to a, a push-pull switch instead of a, a toggle switch that a lot of people put into it. Also, uh, with the L serial numbers, the chassis paint changed from black to gray. And the J model, um, with the J model sets, um, they typically use that second generation blue gray uh, metal looking uh, uh, main tuning knob instead of the shiny uh, German silver. Also with the J, the rear vent holes were enlarged significantly and in most of the, the follow-up radios, they had side louvers to help the, the set breathe as well. And with the P serial numbers, the IF cans changed from round to square. And uh, with the T models, uh, the meter uh, face changed from white to yellow, and, uh, and it could be backlit. So the other way of, of telling what kind of HRO you have is to look at the tubes that are installed. Originally, all HROs came with two and a half volt tubes, which means they were using like a number 58 and 57 and that type of thing. Um, the, the later models um, used six volt tubes and um, of course a six volt power supply, like a 6D6 or a 6C6 and, and that type of thing. So, um, uh, of course the sockets are different for those types of, uh, for the different kinds of tubes. Both of, both of the HROs, either the 2.5 volt model or the 6 volt model, they both worked about the same. So uh, there was really no advantage to trying to retrofit an earlier HRO with uh, the 6 volt tubes. And then you can see on, onward, the RAS was a big military set we'll talk about. The later HRO 5s and 5As, they all um, used different tubes they had a different number of tubes and they also used different tube um, um, in those positions. Now, sometimes you'll hear the, the term HRO senior. Well, that's just an HRO, okay? It's uh, just the ones we have seen. They typically have a S meter, a plug-in crystal. They have phasing and selectivity controls. They came with A, B, C, D coils with band spread. And uh, again, they could use 2.5 or 6.3 volt tubes. And the reason why they started calling regular HROs seniors is because um, National came out with a cost reduced model called the HRO Junior. And you can see it's very plain on the front. Uh, um, fewer controls, no S meter. And if you look at the coil, there's only one um, one graph on the, that coil. So these, um, these did not have band spread. These coils will work in other HROs, and other HROs coils will work in the HRO Junior, but you won't get the benefit of any band spread coils. So the, the HRO Junior was introduced in February 1936 as a cost-reduced HRO. No crystal filter, no S meter, no S meter switch, no phasing or selectivity knobs, no band spread on the coils. The serial numbers started with J and they had black painted chassis or P which had gray painted chassis. And again, now that the junior was out there, they started calling regular HROs, HRO seniors. Now here's a very early HRO junior. It's serial number J125. Uh, if you look inside, it's still got uh, a black painted chassis, black gearbox, round IF coils, no crystal filter, of course. And uh, the serial number is still stamped in front of the antenna and ground connections. And this particular one is J125. So that means that uh, it was the 125th HRO Junior off the line. And here's a um, small set of correct coils. 
um, for the um, HRO Junior. And these did not have any band spread if you look at the connections up on the top of the coils. Now these are, are rarer, by the way, than HRO Seniors. So um, in fact, significantly rarer. Here's another HRO in my collection. It's used by American Airlines. The data tag says it's a receiver type AA HRO, but and it also has a serial number, J245. So that tells me it's an HRO junior, not an HRO. And looking at the front panel, um, I see um, minimal number of controls. I don't see a, an S meter, S meter switch, and that type of thing. So um, it's actually an HRO junior. Here's a, an inside picture of an HRO Junior, the P serial number range. You notice it has a gray chassis and a gray gearbox, and the IF cans are square, not round. Now, the serial number, I believe, is still in front of the antenna and ground switches. At some point, they started stamping or uh, stamping or painting the serial number on the top of the the chassis instead. Here's an interesting, what I call an OEM HRO Junior that showed up on eBay not too long ago. It was uh, sold by Northern Radio. And looking at the coil frequencies and the uh, nomenclatures there, it was used in the Alaska fishing industry. The high watermark of uh, HROs I think was during uh, World War II. They were, they were um, widely used. In fact, some people say that HRO means hell of a rush order and that the uh, national company was told by the government to start making HROs and don't stop until we tell you to. So, and they could not feel um, the worldwide demand and that's why some of the clones uh, were, um, were also um, also uh, introduced, and I'll, we'll talk about that later. So here's some more HRO evolution. Um, in the late 1930s, six-volt glass tubes came standard. Uh, in late 1941, the crystal, the plug-in crystal, actually moves inside that filter box so that it can't um, be easily removed or can't fall out during shipment. Also late 1941, there was ID rings um, put around the B plus and ABC switches, the switches on the left and the right for identification. Um, also during World War II, uh, it was very common to see HRO M's and HRO MX. So they were sort of cost reduced. They didn't come with uh, uh, band spread coils. It just came with regular coils. Uh, sometimes they had a, a one milliamp meter instead of a nice uh, national meter, and uh, the, push, the push button switch that was uh, introduced a while back right beside the S meter was changed, by a ball, uh, changed to a ball toggle switch. So here's a typical HROM and HROMX, and they were, they were a lot of times they were rack mount radios. And um, this just tells you all about that. You can see the two rings around the two switches uh, on the left, uh, left and right side. Now, on this particular HROM, the serial number is no longer at the, at the, the antenna terminals. It's um, painted on the top of the chassis. And so here's a couple of pictures. So this serial number is A144A, it looks like. And so what happened is... Um, um, you, you would think A came out before D, but it didn't. And, and also, they made so many HROs during the war, they were running out of uh, serial numbers. So they went back and started over um, with the alphabet again. So it gets a little weird uh, on serial number. Also, the HRM um, typically had a round, yellow-faced backlit meter. And you can see the pull switch there. Right below the um, right below the the meter there. Now I have another um, HRO in my collection that's uh, 
uniquely, it's, it's, everything's marked um, with, a, with a, what turned out to be the serial number of the receiver, um, which is M243. And you'll notice each coil is also uh, stamped M243. So you know that uh, these coils were originally sold with this receiver. And this receiver was sold right after World War II surplus, uh, purchased by a ham whose sonic key now, who was a glider pilot in World War II. Here's a, a close up of the M243 stamped on both the radio and the coil. And sometimes the serial number is stamped on the coil, usually not on front. Usually it's, it's actually on one of the, the sides of the coils or whatever. Uh, but what I've been told, uh, this radio, because everything was stamped, uh, it was meant to be an export model. So it probably was destined to, to go to the UK or something, but after the war ended, um, it was surplus. And here you can look inside. Um, you have gray painted chassis, square IFs. Uh, the crystal has not yet been put inside the, the filter box. It's still plugged in at the top. Now, one of the earliest uh, ads for the HRO um, actually showed this configuration, which they, it's called the HRO SPC, or the Special. It's an HRO Senior, and it's combined with this SPC unit, which is actually the power supply, coil, uh, container, and the loudspeaker, all built into one rack mount unit. So you see the receiver at the bottom, and then you see everything else is in this uh, SPC unit. Here's um, one that I have that I use daily. Uh, you can see a, uh, an HRO uh, at the bottom. And then uh, in the rack, you've got uh, uh, a coil box and a power supply. And you can't see the, I mean, I'm sorry, the coil box and the, meter, and the speaker uh, with the nice cloisonne uh, there, national Cloisson uh, emblem, and uh, you'll see a picture here in a second of the of the power supply that's that's actually behind the speaker. This this receiver is very interesting. If you look at the contract number in the bottom of the data tag, it says LL number nine three one nine five, and it's dated October twenty first, nineteen forty one. So just before Pearl Harbor, and um, the LL means it was a lend lease receiver. So uh, even, even though it's a Navy receiver, it was meant for some other country's Navy, not, uh, not the U.S. Navy. Uh, here's uh, another picture of a modern SPC. Um, you can see the coils um, lay um, sideways in the coil box. And you can see uh, on the side of the coils, sometimes they have the frequency and also sometimes they'll even have the serial number uh, of the coil. Now, if you have a, it's okay if you have an HRO that has a mixed set of coils, they'll, they'll typically work. Um, there's probably some advantage to actually going in there and tweaking up the coils for a particular set, uh, but I've never done that. And uh, uh, that's something I need to try sometime. But I've never, I've never run into a situation where a, uh, one coil from one HRO wouldn't work in another HRO. Here's the back of that SPC unit, and you can see the nice power supply um, uh, there. Now here's another uh, HRO version, just wanted to mention. It's, it happens to be T239. You can see it has a sort of a, a, a late um, model, a nice meter, round meter. It's got the national emblem. Um, and um, still has a pull switch for the meter. Uh, everything else looks normal. It does have a band spread coil inside. And this is actually a second generation uh, coil because it has a black background and white printing. The graph is in white on top of those, um, uh, of those um, charts there. Now the T239 happens to still have the serial number uh, etched in the... Uh, the top of the chassis right beside the antenna and ground connections. Now, how about racks? 
uh, National made two racks, and they're really scarce, and collectors really like them because they uh, makes it really nice to have uh, your rack mount HRO and speaker or power supply in a rack. Um, the LLR, LRR rack was called the lightweight radio rack, and it was 24.5 inches tall. There was also a later MRR, or military radio rack, that's 29 inches tall. Both of them are very uncommon. Uh, they're very useful collectors. National people really like them. So uh, if you happen to see one at the ham fest, um, uh, I, would, I, would, I would snatch it up. Now the tallest national radio uh, with a 40 inch tall rack was the US Navy RAS. Now this is the only national with 175 KCIF instead of 456 KC. So um, as you can imagine, the coils for this radio are unique and they're not interoperable with HROs. The nice thing about a uh, Navy RAS is that if you're lucky, it'll have data tags on every one of the modules, the radio module, the, power, the rack power supply, the rack speaker, and the big rack uh, coal box. Also, this receiver was initially made to, um, to be used on ship. And so um, to keep the, to prevent the uh, coils from possibly popping out, say if it was on a battleship and they fired the guns, the coils have little kick plates, I call them, which are removable, by the way. And the uh, receiver has two locking levers to actually lock the um, uh, coil in place. Probably the most famous RAS was actually taken off of a Navy ship and given to the uh, Australian Coast Watchers there uh, on Guadalcanal and used in their command uh, post. And you can see that in the left, um, in the left of that picture. The radios on the right are, are made from made by a company called AWA, or Amalgamated Wireless Association, which was actually uh, RCA in, in Sydney, Australia, and they, they made these radios for the various uh, planters and the folks on the, the Pacific Islands uh, to use to keep in contact with each other uh, prior to World War II. Here's a, a better picture of the, um, of the part of the RAS. Uh, you can see the locking levers. It has a rack power supply with one switch on it, on-off switch. Now the coils, um, they, are, they stand up. Uh, the coils also have uh, individual data plates on them that are etched. Um, these are removable, and sometimes you see them removed, but it's uh, very nice if, if they happen to be on. And they'll tell you if it's an RAS-1 or an RAS-5, or, and uh, either... Either of those will work in either model um, RAS. But the, um, the reason why they have those, those uh, metal data tags on the coils is that there was a, um, uh, a need to, for the radio operator to see the coils um, very quickly, very easily to speed up um, um, coil switching. So that's why they stand up, which means that the, the, the coil rack is much um, larger than the SPC uh, built-in coil rack, where the co where the um, where the um, coils lay lay uh, sideways. Now there's one one confusion. There's always an exception, and um, so here we have a, a, a an HRO model RBJ. And it also has a 456 kCIF. It looks like um, uh, an HRO Junior, very simplified front panel, no S meter, and but it has the locking levers for the coils. Um, I think these were mostly used with direction finding sets. So, um, you know, it's possible that um, you could, um, oh, the RBG coils, the RBJ coils will work in a, in a regular HRO or HRO Junior. Um, but the RAS coils uh, will not work in an RBJ, for example. So, so just be aware. Now here's, um, 
uh, HRO fives or HROW. So these are typically military sets, uh, sort of the latter part of World War II. If you're lucky, you'll have a nice long rectangular data tag in the top right hand corner, and it'll tell you what the model of it is. Um, these all tip, these typically uh, also are stamped MFP, and they have a golden U color to them. And this was the moisture and fungus protection that they were putting um, uh, because a lot of these sets were going to the Pacific. They also used um, metal uh, octal Jan tubes, except for the 6V6. So you start seeing metal tubes instead of all glass tubes. This one has a, a Marion one milliamp round meter. Does not have any ventilation holes or um, louvers on the side. Around this time, they also introduced um, uh, silver front coils, if you will, um, where the f instead of having the uh, paper um, charts on the front of the coil in the logging chart, they went ahead and made them in metal, uh, etched metal, so that they would be uh, resistant to weather. Also, the meter switch is no longer a pull switch. It's now a kind of a big um, uh, toggle switch. They called it the bat-handled switch. And if you see one with a data tag that says it's an HROW, well, that means it was used by the or made for the U.S. Signal Corps. So you can see the golden color, the golden gearbox there. Here's a closer picture of, uh, of that, of the, of the MFP. Now the, bad, the downside of this is that if you're gonna say replace the capacitors in a receiver like this, you've got to first scrape off the, um, uh, the, uh, the varnish um, around the contacts before you replace components. So. And, and some of these, if they've been abused, put in attics and that type of thing, you'll start seeing this, this, uh, um, this varnish peeling off on the, on the front uh, of the radio. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is a, this is a MFP um, receiver here, and you can kind of see the, the controls are, are slightly golden in color. And here's a close-up picture where you can actually see the, 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 the results of the fungus um, uh, protection. And this particular one has a nice um, tag, and it says it's a type HRO5, so it's one of the later black HROs. And T, T means table, table model. And uh, uh, R would be a rack-mounted receiver. Now, uh, a lot of military HROs were um, named um, uh, um, because of the military wanted them to do that. The R105s tend to be the U.S. Coast Guard, pre-World War II HRO seniors, R106, uh, another name for the U.S. Army Signal Corps, HROM, and uh, some are, a lot of R106s went to the British. So let's talk about... Uh, end of the war and post-World War II models. Um, typically, um, what you'll see are, is an HRO5A1. It's similar to the HRO5 we just saw, except it has an extra stage of audio. It also has a new noise limiter control, which is that control to the left of the main tuning knob. Um, Usually, you'll see it, the meter could be round or square, but if, if you ever see a square S meter on a black HRO, that means it's, it's definitely um, post-World War II or just right at the end of World War II um, or, or beyond. So, um, and that meter may not be illuminated. So here's the uh, close-up of the, uh, the noise limiter control and also uh, the square meter on the, and all this set also has silver faced coils with band spread there on the front. And here's a close up view of, uh, of a silver faced coil. So these are the latest um, coils. Now, um, I would always look at HRO, uh, if, if you see one of the ham fest or swap meet, look at the data tag uh, and, and hopefully it, their data tag will be there on the top right-hand corner. They made a handful of HRO6s. They're very, very rare. 
Uh, I only know of two uh, that have showed up, but um, there could be more. This particular one has a, uh, a data tag that says type HRO6T, again, T, T for table. And uh, my friend who had this model, he uh, compared it with an HRO5, and he said there was very uh, little difference between an HRO5 and an HRO6. Um, just, uh, I think, a resistor or two in the noise limiter circuitry. So, um, um, but they're very collectible. And also, here's the, um, the stamped serial number on the chassis of that HRO6. Now, the last HRO we're gonna talk about here was the uh, HRO7. Um, interesting thing about the uh, table model, or the 7T, it was sort of this um, uh, grayish uh, color. And uh, whereas the HRO7R um, was uh, black, and uh, it has a, a new rack, a much nicer Art Deco looking rack, and the, uh, the SPC unit that has the uh, integrated call box, speaker, and power supply, it's sort of a new model as well. Um, the coils are a little different, and there's actually uh, coil lever levers to kind of snap the coil and hold the coil in. Um, those coils will work in the earlier units, but they just don't look right. So, and these, this radio came out uh, around 1947. The other thing is um, these sets use miniature tubes, not the, uh, you know, the larger uh, octal tubes. And also you'll start seeing receivers with uh, OA2 uh, voltage regulator tubes, which is also a small tube. Now you have to be careful with HROs. They can be a dangerous radio. Uh, on the earliest models, there was B plus on the meter terminals. Um, the, and also there's a B plus on the rear chassis speaker terminals, the two, two wire speakers used with these sets. There was no fuse in the early doghouse power supplies um, and no switch actually to turn them on and off, um, which was an oversight. Later on, um, the speakers actually came with uh, a grounding strap where you could strap the speaker to the set, um, which would uh, keep the uh, keep uh, minimize uh, shock wrist. And it's always really good. Um, you should always turn off the B plus before changing the coil, or you're going to get a, a huge pop. And also, there's a possibility of grounding the B plus if you stick the coil in uh, the wrong way. So you have to be real careful. There's a whole lot of different uh, national power supplies. Um, some of them were uh, predated the HRO. Um, so you just have to kind of look at them, figure out what you've uh, got. If you remember the SW2 and SW4 and SW5 sets, they were brown or, or sort of brown and they had sort of the brown kind of blends into black like the uh, power supply seen in this picture in the bottom right hand corner. That's the correct color. And some of the earliest HROs you see actually come with a doghouse supply that are not black. They're, uh, they're brown. And uh, um, you can also see that one in the top, the two in the top right hand, uh, on the top of this slide, neither one of them have a, a power switch on them, which is uh, not a good thing. Now, the, the power supplies that started um, coming with the uh, original HROs typically will be something like this. They're called a, a National Velvet Power Supply, and um, they call it an AB because it provides A voltage and B voltage. Oops. And um, hopefully it'll have a, a switch, but it probably, probably won't have a power supply. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, a fuse. So um, you, need to, you need to do that. Here's a, a much later um, uh, model 697 power supply. And this was a standard uh, power supply. Uh, and you notice it does have a switch. I think it is fused inside. This particular one was made for a, um, to be used either uh, on 115 or 230. So it's a pretty nice uh, doghouse, one of the later doghouse power supplies. Six volt, of course, filaments. Here's um, probably the best of the US made um, power supplies for a tabletop HRO. 
and it actually was made for the HROW, the one that we saw earlier. And it's a square power supply. It's got a fuse in it. It's got a switch on the front. Uh, it's nicely marked with data tags. And also the, the main capacitor, instead of being soldered in, it's actually a plug-in unit, so it can be replaced very uh, quickly or easily. So this is a nice power supply if you can find one. Now, the British did not like our doghouse supplies, so they actually made their own HRO power supplies in a lot of cases. And it, they're also square, and they show up on eBay from time to time, and they're marked, uh, they're marked uh, usually with a data tag as well. And here's a, a good look inside of the back of it. It's made very nicely. It'll work on a, a number of different voltages. You can, uh, you can see the fuses there. Um, so, and it's also um, louvered uh, for um, so it'll breathe and that kind of thing. So that's a good power supply too. Now rack mount power supplies. Um, if you see one with a single switch, power switch, it's probably a World War II version. Um, but if you happen to see one with two switches on it, that's, that's quite possibly one from the, um, the very earliest rack mount um, HROs, or even uh, the AGSs. If you remember that Fort Wayne airport receiver, that the big tall thing that had two uh, AGS-like radios in it, this would be the power supply for that type of configuration. So pretty rare. And... Uh, a dual power unit. Um, so um, glance at every black rack power supply you see and uh, uh, if you see one with two switches I would recommend you pick it up. Now HRO speakers were two wire speakers that means they have a transformer in the sp uh, mounted on the speaker uh, to match the impedance. They came in different sizes I think these are uh, 10 inch on the right and 12 inch on the left. National also had a, a number of uh, rack mount speakers. This is a smaller national speaker um, and it, they typically have Jensen speakers inside. Here's a dual uh, national speaker and uh, you see a lot of these types of speakers used in the uh, or uh, in the 30s or the 40s at airports um, with, with nationals. This is the most common rack speaker. This is a World War II era um, national rack speaker. It has the nice Cloisonne uh, national emblem on the front. A lot of times that's missing. It's a, it's a bigger speaker too. If you see a speaker like this, this is the earlier uh, national speaker. Um, if you look, it's, it's actually got a stamped uh, national symbol in the top. It's actually metal over a wood frame. Most of these are four wire speakers, which means they worked with the AGS or the uh, FB7, the, the ham uh, uh, receiver, the cost reduced ham receiver, and they'll be four wire. So uh, they also work with the uh, later um, moving coil receivers, and we'll talk about that, that in just a second as well. So these, this is earlier. If you do buy one of these speakers, make sure it's a two wire speaker as opposed to a four wire speaker if you plan to use it with an HRO. Now, HROs were very popular. Um, the style of the radio was popular. So a lot of people made HRO looking radios, either using the same uh, PWD dial and the uh, same gearbox and the same uh, capacitor, or they might have made their own uh, that looked similar. Um, so um, we're, let's talk about these different uh, HRO clones. Probably the rarest is um, uh, one that was made for the New Zealand Post Office. And of course, you don't see many of those over here. Um, there's a really nice YouTube video. If you Google uh, New, Yo uh, New Zealand Post Office 1939 YouTube, there's a great video um, that shows a number of these in action. Now, Australia had one called a Kingsley AR7, which was also called the Army Reception Set 1. And I think the, the Army Reception Set 1 model has a black painted front panel, whereas this particular one, which was used by the, the Air Forces, uh, usually has a much shinier um, front panel. And the coils are also shiny as well. So, 
and has a very similar PW dial in it. Now here's an interesting set also made uh, in uh, Australia by Amalgamated Wireless, which was RCA in Sydney, Australia. National couldn't make enough HROs, so they took it upon themselves to actually make a version of the HRO that they called the AMR, or American Radio um, 100 or 101. The 101 is a rack mount receiver, and the 100 is a tabletop model. And we'll, I'll show you both of them. But these, these show up um, quite frequently. They came out near the end of the war, not too many of them. I think there was a lot of them surplused after the war. These are actually very good performers uh, because they're late model HROs, if you will, um, but they don't get much uh, respect in the collector community. And typically uh, they have greenish, sort of dark greenish paint and the paint, paint jobs typically aren't too good. So uh, a lot of them you'll, you'll have to repaint if you really want to uh, you know, keep it. Um, the rack mount models came in this huge um, transit case um, and it's marked. Uh, Model AMR 101, and uh, it has this other SC CD 41244 uh, model uh, stamp on it as well. So they made them for the U.S. Signal Corps, and they shipped them to the U.S. Here's an inside picture of the transit case. The universal power supplies up at the top, so it'd work on 110 or 220, and I think also on six volts. The receiver's in the middle. Of course, it's got plug-in coils, and at the bottom is a metal coil box with the, with the rest of the set of um, metal coils. Now you'll notice that the coil um, has a chart on the left, but a logging, uh, sorry, a graph on the left, logging chart on the right. That tells me it's not a band spread coil. So they sometimes call this the reverse Lend-Lease radio. Here's uh, a data tag, and uh, all the serial numbers are usually around 1500 and uh, or higher. Um, here's a, a set of the coils in that metal coil box. Sometimes you see the coil box on eBay uh, by themselves. Uh, again, they got a logging chart on the, on the right, which tells you it's not a band spread coil. Also, uh, they look very similar to HRO coils, but they're definitely not interoperable. If you look over to that left um, coil, it has a, um, a head sticking out of it, which, uh, so you do, definitely do not want to try to put one of these inside your uh, American uh, US uh, HRO. Here's uh, a picture of the um, AMR or American Radio 100, which is the tabletop model and the uh, power supply that came with it. And you can see the, the paint um, kind of peeling off there um, on the top lid label. Um, Here's a view looking down at it. You can see the crystal, instead of sticking up straight up, it's, uh, it's laid over on its side. You still see the national gearbox um, and, uh, and capacitor unit there. Um, you see the audio transformer over on the uh, left side, which means that the, uh, the speaker that comes with it uh, actually, um, uh, it doesn't have a transformer in it. The transformer is in the set instead. The meters, if you're lucky, you'll have a nice meter that, uh, that talks about, uh, it mentions Sydney, Australia on it. So, And here's a, a different um, AMR-100. This one, instead of being made for the U.S. Army Signal Corps, it was actually made for the U.S. Navy. It's gray instead of a greenish color. Has a different data plate here. Still says 1944 on it when the contract was, was, uh, was done. Also, this Navy unit has a, um, a, a square meter, and it's, uh, it looks like it's hand-created um, there. So um, anyway, these are nice sets, and, and they do show up um, from time to time. Now, the Germans also uh, liked HROs, couldn't get them, so they made their own. And uh, the uh, set used during World War II was called a Korting KST. And you can see um, a set here with the external power supply and speaker. Uh, and the coils, the coils are different. They're, they're similar, but they're dif different. Here's the National Factory actually testing 
a German courting KST after the war and comparing it with a national uh, American uh, national HRO. And I think it's a pretty good performer. There was also another set by Siemens that doesn't really look like an HRO, but uh, they, electrically, it's supposed to be very similar. It's got a much different look to it. And, uh, and the, the plug-in coils actually plug into the top instead of in the front. It's a very strange set, very rare set. Uh, probably won't find one of those around. Now, after the war, the East Germans continued to make um, uh, HRO-looking receivers, and the, the post-World War II models are called AQST, and they're very similar. Um, the power supply is similar and speaker, um, so you'll see these show up from time to time as well. Here's a Japanese HRO clone, if you will. Um, it's actually the shortwave receiver R140M. This particular model was captured on Atu in the Aleutians and uh, brought back and also um, compared um, with the American HRO by, by, uh, by National. This was manufactured in March 1942. Here's another um, HRO clone, believe it or not. Uh, sometimes they call this the flying HRO. Uh, this is a, the Chi Mark I aircraft receiver. And you can see it, uh, it does not have a PWD on it, uh, but it does have plug-in coils. Here's a nice set of the complete set with extra coils, nice power supply, and that type of thing. So um, now here's a very interesting uh, HRO um, that came, that's in France. And uh, it's by a company called Radio LL. And uh, notice the data tag. It says National Collins SAF. So uh, it also mentions Paris. So uh, I mean, these are still nationals, but they um, looks like they were like remanufactured um, and sold to the the French market. Here's a picture of the complete uh, radio. Inside, it looks very much like an HRO, and uh, on the front, it does too. Um, uh, actually, it looks more like an HRO Junior because it doesn't have an S meter, for example. And the uh, doghouse power supply is very nice. Nice power switch. Also, a, uh, it's adjustable uh, for, uh, for different voltage, different line voltages. Here, looking down, it's got a gray national uh, gearbox. So here's a close-up picture of that nice doghouse supply with the variable line voltage, and it also has a radio LL data tag up on the top. Very rare. Um, the Swiss used some German receivers that were built prior to uh, 1939, and this one actually is a 1939 model called the E39, and uh, uh, a small quantity of these uh, were used by the Swiss. Um, they look very, they're very nice looking sets. Here's a, uh, a closer view of the uh, data tag and also the, uh, the, the PWD. Now, where, where do you find these? Well, you find them at Hamfest, um, swap meets. Here's a, a nice set, a speaker, doghouse power supply, and uh, the, the normal four A, B, C, and D coils in a nice wooden coil box. And it was on Craigslist some time ago for $200. Uh, and that's a rack mount receiver too, by the way. Now, this is a, a later HRO. Um, uh, not, not, uh, the only reason why I bring it up, uh, a friend of mine said he um, uh, picked this up at a ham fest in Oregon about two weeks ago uh, for $5. So uh, you can get some real bargains. Um, uh, these heavy radios, you know, we're all getting older and uh, it's getting tougher to, uh, to handle these uh, all-in-one type of radios. One of the nice things about a, a national HRO is that uh, everything's are separate. Speaker's separate, the, the power supply is separate, uh, radio's separate, so um, there's nothing that weighs too much. So even if in uh, our advanced years you can still uh, manipulate and handle um, a nice tabletop HRO. So further reading, uh, the best um, 
site that I know of is uh, Henry Rogers Radio Boulevard um, website. Uh, if you um, just Google uh, National Cream of the Crop, it'll take you to this wonderful site, which has uh, just terrific information on all sorts of different models of HROs. I also have a follow-up presentation um, called the National Moving Coil Communications Receivers. These uh, were um, in the product line from 1936 to 1949. Here's probably the most famous of the uh, moving coil receivers. And this was the first handband only receiver. You can see the, the, there's five holes underneath the main tuning knob, and uh, one is 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. And uh, it has a big um, uh, block of, of coils that are moving internally when you, um, when you change the bands and you get that little white indicator uh, which band you're on. So, uh, and this is also, these use a four, co a four wire coil speaker um, with it. So, so I'd like to th thank all these uh, various folks for uh, providing information for this presentation. If you happen to come across an oddball or early HRO or some other national, that you're trying to figure out what it is or, or date it, feel free to, uh, to contact me. Uh, and also, uh, thanks for watching and for supporting the Antique Wireless Association. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.